case I'd like to show you that exemplifies this quite nicely. Uh, this young lady is a very sweet young, young lady who uh, has a bad problem with partial complex seizures. She had her first seizure on day of life one, uh, perhaps as a result of uh, some birth trauma. She, there was a vacuum extraction used following an uncomplicated, uh, pardon me, an, an, an uneventful um, pregnancy, but a little bit difficult delivery. Fortunately, she didn't have any other seizures until about the age of 12. And from that point on, developed a progressively severe partial complex seizure problem. And what became even more pronounced was the anxiety component of her partial complex events. Uh, initially, she was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. She was told she had ADHD and learning difficulties and things like that. She kind of struggled and had some social isolation during adolescence. She had reasonable control, but would have these breakthroughs that were very disorganizing for her life. She got worked up as the time went by, and there was initially some concern over in the region of the left Sylvian Fisher whether or not there was some hypervascularity. She had some flow voids, or so they thought, and some volume loss in the left Sylvian Fisher. She saw one of my partners uh, a few years ago, had some additional workup, including an angiogram, and there was no evidence of a vascular abnormality. I cheated a little bit and brought forward an SEEG. Oops, sorry. Brought forward an SEEG picture, but it very nicely demonstrates the attenuation and loss of cortex, the thinning of the cortex present there in the left uh, insular region and in the Sylvian fissure. And that was the sort of structural abnormality that she had. She has this volume loss in the left insular cortex. She's had an updated MRI and uh, pardon me, MRA and MRV that, again, shows no evidence of a vascular lesion. She was evaluated with a PET, showed temporal and left frontal hypometabolism, and demonstrated as time went by progressively severe loss of control with medication. Oftentimes, her events were characterized by a pronounced uh, component of anxiety that really was robbing her of quality of life. Her EEG showed left-sided temporal, some wide, uh, some wide spread discharges. Interictally, she had a lot of left temporal de delta activity with some burst of anterior temporal rhythmic delta activity. So she underwent an um, evaluation with an invasive strategy that targeted these areas that we had nice concordance between her functional imaging, her EEG, her symptoms, and this structural abnormality. So we fashioned a um, strategy that centered really on her insula, on her sylvian fissure, and covered areas of her left frontal cortex through the inferior frontal gyrus, the middle frontal gyrus, et cetera, trying to get good coverage across the insula there and interrogate this area. And you can see from this sort of composite of pictures how nicely the ROSA allows us to, to do this, to reach across the insula. And each of these electrodes was planned very carefully, the trajectory, the entry point. The insula is a region of rich vascularity, and this has to be planned with great care. I will submit to you that for my first couple of cases, I spent as long planning the case as I did doing the case, and that implies, you know, multiple hours of planning. Um, I'm not a, a world expert, but after a dozen cases, I've got the planning down, so I can now plan a case usually between about 60 and 90 minutes, whereas at the beginning it was it was at least two sessions of a couple hours or you know two hours and then an hour and a half later or something like that. So it, early on it takes some time, but but it does like so many things it does come with time. So we planned this strategy to to nicely sample the insula and she tolerated that very nicely. She underwent a period of monitoring where we were able to capture a number of her representative seizures, and this is a busy slide, so the point here is just my colleague who did the, 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 epilepsy, the uh, epilepsy um, read, the, the read of the EEG, was very able to, to demonstrate exactly which electrodes were involved. Now, this was a challenging case because the electrodes that were involved were ones that were deep within the insulin. So what we, so what we needed to do, we were also very proximal to uh, right around her um, motor cortex. So we mapped her out uh, utilizing a mapping strategy, which is detailed there. We were able to elicit seizures. We were able to map her out. And we came back with a resection strategy that focused on the Sylvian fissure. 
Well, most of you who work with neurosurgeons know the sylvian fissure is that that's kind of ground zero of of, um, of the human brain. We split the fissure from lateral to medial. We decorticated the fissure under the operating microscope, and then we did a little bit of post resection ECOG. It was a very well tolerated case. She did not have any new deficits following the procedure, and she's done very very well. She's only, you know, she's less than a year out, so seizure freedom is, you know, I put it in red, but that doesn't mean a whole lot yet because we're not far enough out. She tolerated it well. She's had a follow-up EEG that at this point looks quite normal. She's done very, very well. Um, so we conclude that she was an excellent candidate for uh, SEEG. She had a structural abnormality. She had a structural abnormality in the insula. She had a... Um, a very heavy burden that was becoming progressively worse. She's a motivated kid from a motivated family. And so far, she's done splendidly well. The procedure was kind of life-changing for her, and we hope that it will continue that way. Um, would you like me to take questions, or would you like me to go ahead and present the second case? Are there any questions on this case? I'm, I'm a little over time. It's uh, about just. I'm at about 25 minutes right now. I've got another case to show you. Uh, I can take questions on this case, or I can go ahead and move forward and show the second case. Whatever. I'll pause for a moment and see if there's any questions. Hearing none, I'll just show you the second case that I had that I had prepared for you today. But please feel free to interrupt me if if someone's dying to ask a question. This is another challenging case because of its localization. And again, exemplifies the value of um, SEEG to kind of reach deep and look to places where conventional grid-based strategies may not be so helpful. This is a seven-year-old uh, little boy, a uh, very sophisticated family, totally normal boy until at age four, he had a partial complex seizure while he was eating. And his was an interesting pattern because all through his seizures, he would characteristically maintain a basic level of wakefulness, but would develop some staring and some slurred speech and unsteadiness. What was really uh, got him was his sort of background decline, both in speech and in cognitive therapy. He developed a characteristic pattern where he had these, these morning seizures that were characterized by an aura, and he would have some drawing up of his face and a characteristic sort of partial complex event. He, he was worked up a number of times, both at our center and others. All of his metabolic studies are normal. He had um, fast frequencies in his left uh, central and anterior region during his initial EMU stay with us. Note we got a single seizure captured at that point. Interestingly, interictally, he has this fairly constant delta theta activity in his left frontal and temporal regions, but the most concerning thing that we found was that he had this independent spiking activity that was present on both sides, both left and right. The predominance of information suggested left frontal anterior activity and he was managed medically for a long time. He was initially treated with, with um, pardon me, he was, yeah, he was initially treated, um, I believe it was on trileptal, and then that was over time developed with um, Depakote, Keppra, and Diastat for breakthroughs. Depakote held him in check for probably the longest, you know, probably the longest period of time that he had, um, and then he's sequentially sort of started failing more and more and more and more rapidly. So a number of his studies were negative, and I'll, I'll jump to that a little bit. His PET was non-focal, his MRI was stone cold normal, but his MEG was, was not. His MEG was concordant, not surprisingly, I suppose, with his, with his EEG that showed good localization and a tight dipole cluster, a left anterior uh, central anterior uh, localization. He underwent, as time went by, I'm, I'm compressing a, a very long period of time into a brief summary here, four periods of video EEG monitoring with concordance of, act, with concordance of finding of a left central and left anterior 
uh, consistent finding. Now, he did have this independent discharges on both sides, but my epileptologist found the, con the convincing uh, body of data to suggest left anterior onset despite this activity. So we came together, talked about this, said, what do we need? We need to cover his motor region. We need to cover his insula. My colleague was highly, highly suspicious of a area of involvement involving the operculum of the face immediately adjacent to the motor strip. So we talked about this and we planned an extensive um, depth electrode-based investigation that incorporated a number of trajectories and incorporated basically the superior, the middle, and the inferior frontal gyrus, as well as most closely targeting this one singular gyrus um, in the motor cortex the, of the face. You can see here the, these are projection views of crossing the inferior frontal gyrus crossing the insula and sampling widely the composite three-dimensional film down in the right corner. So that we ended up with a strategy that summarily looked like this, and we ended up with a series of invasive recordings. Interictally, we had a, essentially continuous uh, spike and wave activities from three electrodes that were right in that gyrus that Dr. Goyle was most suspicious of. We captured eight typical seizures, and they were all coming from the same three electrodes. Um, he was mapped, the mapping, again, a remarkably sensitive, highly focused area, and we, and we concluded that we had tight focal localization, but one of the technical challenges was this was immediately adjacent to his motor strip. It was immediately superficial to the white matter that, su that supported his speech capacity. His superior longitudinal fasciculus was immediately below that. We knew he had speech in that hemisphere. Now, he was reviewed. He was a, this was a sophisticated family, and he was reviewed at more than one center, and more than one center came back and said, you know, I'm not sure I'd do anything. You know, this may be one to punt on. We came up with this. This was the resection strategy that we thought would be appropriate and helpful based on that the findings of his invasive recording. And we, we, um, we planned a surgical resection to do that resection of frontal operculum based on the findings of what we had found with our grid-based investigation. This case is wonderful insofar as showing and demonstrating how these technologies can be merged together and fused on the, the uh, frameless navigation platforms. This is a stealth-based platform, but Brain Lab works equally well, and so do the other platforms. They're all DICOM-based. And this is, of course, MRI with superimposed diffusion tensor-weighted imaging showing us both the descending tracks, the motor cortex, as well as the presence of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Super, superimposed on that are our depth electrodes from our SEEG placed uh, from our SEEG placed placement utilizing ROSA. So we could literally cross-reference in real time exactly where we were uh, to do a safe and very focal resection immediately adjacent to very eloquent cortex. An injury to SLF would have uh, induced a conduction aphasia, and uh, an injury to the motor cortex would have uh, expanded well beyond what we were willing to uh, accept with regard to uh, morbidity. So that's what we did. We did a focal topectomy. We utilized stealth guidance with all of these co-registered, um, all of these co-registered uh, modalities, and we ended up with a good result. The youngster was free of, has been free of seizures since we did him. We, he's he's over a year out now. Had a very mild transient, very very mild facial weakness that resolved in about a week's time. Most importantly, his cognition and his behavior. He's made up a ton of lost ground. He still has a lot of room to go, but he's learning at a rate he, was, he, he couldn't possibly have done before. The very troublesome drooling has stopped, but we still have that annoying and worrisome problem. On his follow-up EEG, he still has some of that persistent independent spiking on the right side. And we're following that for now and have not, uh, have not offered or opted 
to pursue that more aggressively at this time. So those are two cases that I think exemplify these conclusions. I think these rows of base strategy really do offer promise for meaningful investigation of medically resistant ep epilepsy in children. There are some technical challenges in children, but they're by no means insurmountable. We have done two children less than five years of age. We've planned in those two children just under 20 trajectories, and there's only one that I was not able to place. That was a, due to a combination of thin skull and a, a sharp angle of the trajectory. Um, several of them were loose upon removal, but they none of them were sufficiently loose that we needed to stop monitoring from the electrode, take the electrode, anything out, or anything like that. In early experience, they seem very safe. They seem very effective. I recognize the short follow-up that we have available, so I'm not going to make any statements that outstrip my data. But preliminary experience, I think, is encouraging. This may be a meaningful advance in, minimally, in advancing minimally invasive strategies. This is the summary of what I said before, and that's my concluding slide, and I'd be happy to take any questions that people might have. And I apologize for running a couple of minutes over. Thank you all.